So this letter to the Ephesians uh, is a pretty short one. I like to use these scripture journals just as a visual. Uh, you could sit down and read through or listen to, uh, basically did it on the way down here this morning, uh, the entire letter in about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but it's a letter that really uh, packs a theological punch, I guess you could say. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty general letter. And so as far as jumping into you know, a letter that someone wrote to somebody else, you would certainly want some context in what the backstory was so that you wouldn't misinterpret the letter, of course. Uh, the good news about um, this letter to the Ephesians is that it's pretty general. Uh, by contrast, you know, if you were to read something like 1 Corinthians, let's say, there's like six or seven specific issues that that church was struggling with, and you need kind of a lot of context and background. This was lit, written to the church at Ephesus, and it's just more general. It's a general statement about uh, who Christ is and the function of the church, and this kind of new humanity is really the idea that God's creating us as a new humanity in Christ and what that's supposed to look like. The city of Ephesus was kind of like uh, kind of a regional center that other churches, uh, other cities, excuse me, um, it was kind of like the, the flagship, so to speak, in that area. And so this letter actually went to Ephesus, and then Paul wanted it to go to those other areas as well. And so this morning it's come to us. And so here's a general letter about the work of Christ and what he's doing in the church and making this new humanity, being created in Christ Jesus. And so um, this particular section right here, look at those first two words. He says, and you. <laughs> so he's addressing them, and by extension, he's addressing us now. He wants to talk specifically to us. And so along this theme of being created in Christ Jesus uh, there's basically three, uh, this, this passage, 1 through 10, falls very neatly into three kind of sections, three movements. The first one is the human plight. I like the word plight. <laughs> it means a situation or a circumstance that is threatening and or dangerous. Okay? And so we as human beings are in a plight. We're in a situation that is threatening and potentially dangerous, and he describes what that is. First thing about that, you know, just by way of overview, is, you know, you're, you're spiritually dead, you're in bondage, secondly, and thirdly, you're under the wrath of God. And so it's quite a plight, and we'll look at that in just a second. But then in verse 4, two of the most simplest but most important, probably, words in the Bible and in your personal experience is, but God. You're in this dangerous, difficult, threatening situation, but God is going to do something about it. And so he does something about spiritual death and spiritual bondage and the fact that we would be under his judgment. And so we'll look at what God does, God's solution to our plight. And then finally in verses 8 through 10, you see... Okay, we got this difficult, hard situation, this threatening situation we're in. We see that God has a solution, but how is the connection made? How is the connection made between those? And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So let's dive in now and look at the human plight. And it is um, dark, I guess you could say, bleak, to say the least. Paul says, and you were dead and your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Paul used the word walked as like that's the man, that's the lifestyle that you carried out. So trespasses and sins are basically uh, rebellion against God's commands, unbelief in God's character. And so he's speaking to all of us. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But we lived our lives in rebellion against God's will and unbelief against his character and his promises. And he says that this results in you being spiritually dead. And so that's just an interesting, you know, kind of concept. And how do we get our, you know, how do we kind of get our arms around that to understand what's actually happening there? <laughs> to start off with kind of a low level example, um, zombies. <laughs> Who came to church thinking, yeah, we're going to hear about zombies, you know, the undead, all right? don't have to like raise your hand or cheer or anything but how many of you have watched the walking dead a couple all right so some of you are a little shy i don't know i have not seen it but i'm like well this seems to be like the most 
popular like zombie thing in our culture right now. So I, I watched a, a review for 25 minutes and went through like all 10 seasons or something. I'm like, whoa, okay, that's what that is. All right. But, you know, this, this idea of the undead is kind of like a, there's like a body that's animated, but what's animating it is, is not itself, but this other kind of outside power that is leading to chaos and destruction, not to life and blessing. And Paul's kind of saying here to, the, to, to this church, and by extension to really everybody, again, as we'll see in a minute, this is the human condition. We're alive, these people are living, but they're being animated by forces and desires that aren't leading to their blessing and their good. They're the, they're the undead, so to speak. Now, let's be, you know, let's get away from zombies as fast as we can. <laughs> if you flip over to chapter 4, verse 17, it's just a few, you know, again, if you were just reading this little booklet size of it, it would just be a few paragraphs later. And he says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. The Gentiles are nations that don't know God. They're darkened in their understanding. And here's our phrase. They are alienated from the life of God. That's a very good description of what it means to be spiritually dead. You're alienated from the life of God. You're separated from God's essence. He's essential life. Meaning, and so like, you know, kind of like this idea, you can't see him. It's like when he kind of shows up, there's, there's nothing there. You don't resonate with it at all. Okay? You don't hear him. You know, when, when his promises and his story gets spoken to you, there's, there's either kind of an allergic reaction, like, oh, I'm not really interested, or, uh, you know, I don't really like that. You don't taste and see, as we sang this morning, that he is good. There's doubt and skepticism and resistance. And so to be spiritually dead means that, that the, your spirit, your soul is disconnected from God and there's no satisfaction, joy in his presence and knowing him. You're dead. Now, for someone who is spiritually dead, that's no big deal. But I'll tell you by testimony, if you were to take the spiritual life that I have away from me, it would be absolutely devastating to my entire life. And that's not just me. That's the testimony of every true Christian. You're separated from the very essence of reality and life. You're spiritually dead on account of your rebellion. That's our plight. And you, you know, Paul's got in his mind here Genesis the beginning story where Adam and Eve, uh, they sin and they rebel against God. They don't trust God. And so then they are removed from the garden. That's spiritual death, to be removed from the presence of God. We're all spiritually dead. Secondly, we are all following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air that's at work and the sons of disobedience. And we all live according to our passions, carrying out the desires of our bodies and our minds. And so we're spiritually dead, yes, that's number one. But number two, we're in spiritual bondage externally and internally. Externally, we're in bondage to forces in our world that, that control us. You say, what do you mean by that? that? Well, let me explain a little bit. There are things in our world, forces... That in a sense, we humans create, but they end up controlling us. So, for example, government. <laughs> you know, 1776, whatever, you know. <laughs> we create the government, right? And now the government has control over us. We build economic structures. Banks, Wall Street, all these other kind of things. And then now, all of a sudden, the markets are out of control. <laughs> we can't keep interest rates down. Or we raise them. We, like, we created those things, but now they control us. Politics, economics, religion, family, all of these are powers in our world that in a sense we help to build, but then they exert power and influence over us, and they don't do it in such a way to help us love and know God. It's not like Wall Street's like encouraging you to be generous. 
Okay? It's not like the, the, the po politicians in our world are saying, hey, love and trust Jesus more. <laughs> it's a very rare politician that's saying that. And so there's these forces that are in our world, yes, but then the biblical view is that those forces are also influenced by spiritual powers of darkness. And so this kind of helps, you know, have you ever wondered, like, there's definitely enough food in the world to, like, solve world hunger, right? I mean, that's what I've been told my whole life. Why can't we solve it? Why can't we as human beings solve the hunger issue? Why can't we live at peace? Why does there, you know, there keep being wars and rumors of wars? And why is there still abuse? And why is there still racism and classism and sex? Why is that stuff all... Can't we, like, get our act together as humans? Aren't we better than that? In a sense, the Bible would say, yes, but there's spiritual forces of darkness at work that keep tripping us up. And they exert power and influence through politics and through economics and through education and through religion. That's the biblical view of the powers. And they affect the way you live your life. You can't escape it. Okay? There's a few verses here. I'll just give you a couple examples. I got more examples than I probably have time for. Here's one that deals with politicians. Paul's saying, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. He's talking about the gospel there, the good news about Jesus. God decreed that before the ages. None of the rulers of this age understood this. See that phrase, the rulers of this age? For if they had, if they'd known about the gospel, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. And so my only point in, in that statement right there is that there are political powers that are against the will and work of Jesus. That's just the reality. So there's political powers influenced by evil that are against, in some sense, the will and work of Jesus, but of course, they don't win in the end. Let's go to the next one. Next one after that. Let's talk about money and economics. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You see the, the setup here? God and money are equated with each other. The almighty, powerful God, and then the all-powerful dollar, so to speak. And those are forces that are exerting on you. You can't just, like, not interact with money. You can't. You have, to, you have to buy and sell to some extent. And so there's a power there, and there's a worship element there. Spiritual force of darkness are leading you to worship and trust money instead of worship and trust God. Economic powers. One more we'll do. Let's see what we got. Education and philosophy. For though we walk in the flesh, we're humans. We don't wage war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but divine power to strongholds. What are those strongholds? To destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and to take every thought captive under Christ. There's all kinds of philosophical and educational systems that are seeking to undermine the person and work of Jesus. And they're influenced by spiritual powers. And so our plight right now, you know, you go back, okay, we're spiritually dead. We can't see, no taste, hear God. We're also in bondage to these external powers. They're real, they exist, and they affect your life, and they shape you away from God in Jesus. C.S. Lewis said this about these powers. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, the human race, can fall about the devils, these powers. One is to disbelieve in their existence. You know, 21st century modern Americans, oh, there's no such thing as spiritual forces of darkness. C.S. Lewis, you know, not exactly a mental, uh, you know, not mentally incapable, okay? An Oxford scholar, okay, living in the 21st century after World War II. To disbelieve their existence would be a, an error. The other error is to believe and feel an excessive unhealthy interest in them. They, the, the powers, are equally pleased with both errors, and they hail a materialist and a magician with the same delight. And so we must understand part of our human plight is that we are under these powers that are influenced by spiritual authorities and darkness. And here it's called the prince of the power of the air. But more than just that, there's not just external bondage that you experience as a human being. And again, this doesn't matter. Young, old, male or female, doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, doesn't matter what time you live in, these are human conditions. You know, Paul says it there in verse 3, he says, among whom we all once lived. And so, this other, this other bondage that we're in is the bondage to our desires. And this shows you the power of our desires. This is such a good word for our day. 
We live in a day where the kind of ultimate blasphemy is to not live according to your desires. I feel this way, and so therefore I must express this way. That's the gospel of the 21st century, the good news. And that sounds like freedom. I have this desire, I must fulfill it. I have that desire, I must fulfill it. If I don't do it, I'm not being true to myself. And that sounds so right. <clears throat> and Paul is saying, <clears throat> it's actually so wrong. And here's why it's wrong. There are other creatures on this planet who live consistently according to their desires and their instincts. We call them animals. Animals must obey the impulses of their desires and their instincts. That's what they do. And so it's actually subhuman for us to say, well, I have to follow these desires. No, to be made as a special creation in the image of God means that if there is an impulse of selfishness or greed that's corrupt or broken, to be human means that we can say no. But yet again and again and again, we keep saying yes to the things that are against God and that harm ourselves and harm others. And we just keep tripping up over it. We're in bondage. I mean, is there any hope that we're just going to somehow magically become a society where everyone loves their neighbor more than they love themselves? <laughs> Why doesn't that happen? You know, I say this to my kids all the time. How good would our life be if everybody in the house just loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and loved everyone else like they love themselves? This would be an amazing house. And we're Christians. And I know a lot about the Bible. And I do know Jesus, and so does my wife. And we can't get it right. <laughs> Why? Because we're in bondage to our desires. What causes wars and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and don't have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel? These passionate desires within us is what causes strife. And it's, it's our plight as human beings. And so we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We have external bondage to forces of darkness, internal bondage to corruption. And then lastly, and it's like, it's like well, that sounds bad. It, this isn't like a really encouraging sermon, Pastor Mike. Just a minute. Third and finally, you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The most significant problem or threat in our plight as human beings is that all of that rebellion and corruption has led us to judgment by our creator. Now, we need to stop here for a second because that word wrath, we might think of like God is like getting angry and flying off the handle and losing his temper. Not that. Okay, That's not when we talk about wrath. I think a better phrase is righteous indignation, okay? <laughs> Even in your own home, right? Like, if I get angry or something like that, I'll try to defend myself. It's like, I wasn't angry. I, I didn't have a moment of rage. I had righteous indignation, <laughs> right? <laughs> it sounds so much better. Well, with God, that's actually the case, okay? And here's why it's the case. When God created the world good, he loved his world, he loved his creation, he loved his image bearers. And so you think about the world as God's house and human beings as uh, created in his image for fellowship with him, that's God's family. And so when God's family and God's house are corrupt through sinful rebellion, how would you feel if someone came to your house and desecrated your house? How would you respond? You would want to make things right. You would. I know you would. How would you feel if someone came and violated your family? There would be a little righteous indignation. And so, you know, the, the scripture says here that we're walking this way. The end destination 
of human beings in our plight when we live dead in bondage is it results in us experiencing the judgment of God. Now, let me just say a couple quick things before we turn the corner. Number one, you want the judgment of God. At least for everybody else. <laughs> Sorry. When people do bad things, you want them held accountable, don't you? Yes, you do. Now, <laughs> what about you being held accountable before you? Okay, well, now, hey, well, easy preacher. Well, okay, that's hypocritical in case you're wondering. You want judgment, number one. And number two, there's something about this passage that really resonates with us, maybe specifically as Americans, although I'm sure in other countries and cultures as well. But we're, we're all about democracy in this country, right? Everybody is important. Everybody has a vote. Everybody, everybody, everybody. Well, good news, everybody. This is everybody. Not, no one of us in this room is better than anyone else, fundamentally. It's not like this person's achieved more righteousness, this person's a better person, and so now they've escaped the plight of being spiritually dead and under bondage. Nope, we're all this way. We're all in this together, in this human plight. And so, you know, <laughs> the, 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 there is, in a sense, no good news in those first three verses. But you get to verse 4, and this is where God brings a solution. It says, but God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in mercy, and because he has great love for you, he made you alive with Christ. You had a problem with being spiritually dead? Now you're alive. You were under spiritual bondage to external forces and internal passions, but God, who is rich in mercy, because he really loves you, has raised you up above those desires. He's raised you and seated you with Christ above the powers. Amen? You were under the wrath of God, the righteous indignation for your, of, of God for your rebellion. But God, because he's a merciful God and because he really loves you, look at verse 7. Just got to read it. Here's what he's going to do. Instead of showing wrath and righteous indignation and judgment, he says, in the coming ages... He's going to show you the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. It's like an overwhelming sentence. Immeasurable riches of grace and kindness before the expectation, righteously so, was judgment. And now it's the complete opposite. God's plan for you for the rest of your life because you are in Christ is kindness. You'll grow in excitement for that. <laughs> I'm telling like, this is why being a Christian is challenging. That news is so good, you can barely believe it. That's where I'm at. God, like, God is going to show me grace and kindness. What about this and that and my spiritual darkness and I can't see him and I ignore him and all of that stuff that floods your mind and now in Christ, he's just going to show me kindness? It's incredible. And so all of the things that the human plight that we found ourselves in, there's a corresponding match because of God. Now, don't, don't miss that before we move to the last point. This is the reason God does this is not because he looked down anything necessarily good in any of us. Remember, we were all in this together. My wife and I just went to uh, Pfeiffer Orchards and picked flowers. I think that was the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> okay? Which is great. And when I found myself, you know, it was just a, there was just this mass of flowers everywhere. I don't know, thousands, millions. I have no, I have no idea of gauging flowers. And it struck me that my wife and I were only looking for the best ones. And it kind of corresponded, like, here's this mass of flowers, like, kind of like the mass of humanity. And it's not like God looks down and he's like, oh, I'm only going to get the good ones. Because you know what? We're not all these beautiful flowers. That's not who we are. Our plight is that we're broken and corrupt and dark and dead. And God comes to that sea of humanity. It's just his mercy and grace within himself. 
It's nothing external to him. It's just in the very heart of God. Let it be known and let it be clear that God is a God who is full of mercy and full of great love. I mean, Paul could have said he loves you, but he doesn't say he loves you. He says he loves you with great love. So one of the benefits of actually being able to step back and see our actual plight before God explained. Because left to my own, I would never come to the conclusions of verses 1 through 3 about myself. I wouldn't wake up one morning going, yeah, I'm definitely spiritually dead, and I'm in bondage to external powers and my internal passions, and I'm under the wrath of God. I would never come to that conclusion on my own, and neither would you. But that's where we are. But as big of a problem as that is, but God is bigger. The love is bigger. The mercy is bigger. It's greater. And so this is what God has done for us. And note this as well. All of that centers on being connected with Christ. You are raised together with Christ. Why? Because he rose from the dead. He has power to give new life. Because Christ is seated above those powers and I'm in Christ, I have that access to those powers. And because God the Father is only going to treat his son with kindness for the rest of his days and I'm in Christ, guess what I get? All the kindness of the Father to the Son forever. Come on. <laughs> it's, that's what I'm saying. Like, people don't disbelieve Christianity because the promises aren't big enough. They disbelieve Christianity because the promises are so big, and it's like, do we, can we actually live into that? And so lastly... Here's our plight. We were dead in Adam, and now we are alive in Christ. You know, our problem, God's solution, we need a connection. We need to to get connected to God's solution, and you see that in verse 8. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Saved, you're delivered from what? That plight. So you get out of that plight by a free gift. Have you ever gotten a gift so big it makes you uncomfortable you don't want to take it? Let me think about that for a second. Maybe you haven't. Well, if you had loving parents who put you in a house and fed you for 20 years... <laughs> then you had one of those, whether you recognize it or not. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars literally given to you. But if someone were just to come and say, here's a house or here's a car, you'd be like, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And we back away from that because we don't feel like we deserve it. And it actually confronts our pride. That's what this verse is doing here. He says, this is a gift that God gives you so that no one can boast. This is one of the best things about heaven. No one's going to be in heaven, and by the way, no one should be in church, congratulating themselves for the good work that they did to get there. You missed the plight, the death, the darkness, and the corruption. Everybody in heaven's going to go, isn't Jesus good? Isn't he so kind? We wake up the next morning and he's still there, kind. Again and again and again, like an ocean of kindness and grace that never runs dry. And every day you wake up there, it's all by grace. And it just humbles you so that no one can boast. It truly is amazing grace. I mean, I tried this in the first service, so I'll try it again. The song does not go mediocre grace that was flat yeah that was bad (laughs) that's not how it goes when you actually get the scope of the problem i mean it can appeal to to men and women in here i mean when we've got people coming over to the house and we're trying to get the house ready i think of like two or three things that need to be arranged I don't have a scope of the problem. <laughs> Julie does. Fifteen things need to happen before this, these people come over here. And me and the kids are all like, we can only see like two of these. Why are you asking us to do all this stuff? <laughs> and she's very gracious now over the years. 
you know, men, maybe you're in a builder or a contractor or whatever, and you see, okay, this is what needs to be built, and you can kind of get a sense of the scope of what actually needs to happen here. The scope of our plight is broad. The solution of God in Christ is even greater. And it's all done by God's initiation and accomplishment. It's his power, his love, his mercy, his grace, his gift. And so what do we do in response to that gift? The scripture is very clear. It says you believe. It's a receiving of it. One of the hardest parts about actually getting into Christ, getting connected to God, is laying down all of our desire. Like, I can fix this. You can't fix it. That's what makes Christianity unique. It's not like we do a bunch of good things, and now we're connected to Jesus. No. You lay it down, and you receive the gift. One of the things that, as made in God's image, that we can do, that, that no other creature can do, well... Maybe angels, I don't know, we're not talking about that. No other <laughs> created being on earth. Is that we can picture things in our mind. If I said to you right now, you know, picture your bedroom. You could see it in your mind's eye. You can imagine things. You're made in the image of God, so therefore you can image things. You can image in your mind. And so faith, that's a big part of faith, is being able to image And so if you want to get connected to God through Jesus right now, you can do that right now. What you do is you just image, here's Jesus. Chapter 1 says that he's high and lifted up on the throne. He died for your sins and he rose again. And so you image yourself before him and you say, yes, Jesus, I believe what you say about me as part of the human condition. I I recognize that. My plight, that's true of me. And you image that before him. And you can image him, so to speak, on the cross. And you can go there. You can put your hand out, reach out to him and say, I believe that what you did on the cross took my punishment and my shame and my sin. And then you can see him seated on the throne and reach out to him and say, I believe that you can make me new. You do that. And guess what? He does it. It's, that, it's like that simple. It's like, you know, it's almost offensive to us that it would be that simple. But that's what it means, that it's by grace through faith. And so then in the end, in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so what's now happening in our lives, because we are in Christ and we've been raised with him and seated with him and he's going to show us all of his kindness in him, is now that we're this new creation and God is working in us. He's making us more and more like Jesus day in and day out. He's working that in us. And so let me just close with two encouragements. Number one, if you're not sure that you're in Christ, You know, consider your plight, consider what God's done for you, consider how much God loves you, and believe. It's an amazing invitation. And it's one that you need. And secondly, if you're a Christian, you know yourself to be in Christ, then I hope that this reminder is, is in a sense more than a reminder. We talk a lot about Renew 22. Like, live into this. You are spiritually alive. You can hear from Jesus. <laughs> like, you can. You can see things that he wants you to see. You can literally taste and see that he is good. And so, Engage. Believe. You know, if you're here and you're, you're struggling with a, a trial, there's suffering and difficulty, you know, emotional, relational, whatever that is, believe that you have been raised and seated with Christ, and in Christ God is going to be kind to you from now and forevermore. That the trial that you're in is not a lack of kindness or presence on God's part. He's present and he's working for your good. There's no way else he could because you're in Christ. 
And if you're here and you're a Christian and you're, you're struggling with temptation and with sin, and you're like, I'm, this is always going to be this way. That's not true. Because you've been raised and seated with Christ. And he will be with you in the, tr- the struggle and the temptation, the trial now. And one day in the end, he will liberate you fully and finally. Amen? You've been made alive, raised and seated, and he's going to show you kindness forever. You know, it's interesting, you know, here in chapter 2, he's talking about, hey, you used to be this way. You used to be dead. You know, used to be in darkness, so to speak. But there's a temptation for Christians to fall into that again, because later in chapter 5, he says to these Christians, wake up, oh sleeper, wake up, rise from the dead. He's saying to these Christians, like, you are ignoring the beautiful, majestic, magnanimous, I love that word, riches that you have in Christ. Wake up. He's better than anything that the world might offer you. Wake up, and it says Christ will shine on you. So brothers and sisters, friends, being a Christian means being in Christ. Being a Christian means being in Christ. Being a Christian means being in Christ. Nothing less, and there is nothing more.